On this episode of Roll Your Stats, we talk about Aurora, the Air Genasi Ranger. Raised by orcs on the frozen peaks of Govi Altai, this cruel and calculating mistress is as ruthless as the gales that sweep across the icy tundra. Also, we discuss Daffy Duck and the value of a harebrained scheme. Welcome to Roll Your Stats. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Roll Your Stats. It's that podcast where we get together and make a new character. It's me, Trevor. We've also got Peyton. Yo, yo. And Michael. Hello. We're going to get together and make a new character this time. Guys, we uh, had a good time last time making up Brachus, the uh, the auditor, our, our homebrew paladin class. Um, but it's it's that time again. It's time to make a new character. Time to, to explore and broad new horizons. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any point in wasting any time, guys. I think it's time to roll. Let's get let's get right back into this again. Let's let's find out who we're going to start talking about. All right, so then I say we start with the, the the gender of the character. That way we can kind of get an idea in our heads. I agree. That's something that we, we waited a little bit in earlier episodes, and I think that that would, that would set a tone for us maybe a little bit better, and that way we don't have the snafus of, of are they or aren't they a him or a her or a they, and we just knock it out right now. Yep. All right, let's see. It's a three. We got a gal. It's our first gal. Hey, all right. Ooh la la. Our first gal. Let's roll that d20. Let's determine the race. We've got a 12, my friends. That is a Genasi. Does that mean that we roll yet again to find the subclass of Genasi? Oh, you so know it. You so know it. Good call. Um, so we've got we've got air, earth, water, fire. Is that is that kind of what we're working with here? Y- yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think that's that's the the four spread. That's that's a good one. Cool. Um, in that case, let's roll a d4. Um, we'll do air, fire, water, earth. One, two, three, four. One, air. So who wants to take the initiative and check out what exactly comes along with being a Ganassi, specifically an air Ganassi? Is it bad? I think I've already got a name for this character or for this, this no, person. No, tell us. Tell us. I was, thinking, I was thinking Aurora. Aurora, I love it. Uh, you sold me immediately. I I have hopped onto this Aurora bandwagon. <laughs> Aurora, she's the queen of the Borealis. Yes, you oh. you got exactly what I was picturing. Yo, and like I'm I'm already getting images in my head. Like she her her hair is like the Borealis. It like changes oh. colors and shifts and things. Yes. This sort of like ethereal sort of like grouping of 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 power that just sits on top of her head. Oh my goodness, it, it moves and whips like the winds. Yes. Yes. I I, I do, I, I know this is already kind of like, this is prehensile, but I kind of want her to have some type of like ice, type of icy wind elements. I might just be jumping ahead too far, but we'll we'll see. I don't know, you might, you might be reading the future. We yeah. might have a class that fits perfectly for Perhaps. that. Perhaps. Perhaps that's one of the cool things uh, I think about it with her being an air Ganassi is like that could be, you know, she could be queen of storms where it's all about the, the, the rain and the wind and the power that comes behind that. Or it could be, like you said, it could be, it could be the chill that comes along with that frost. She, she could even be like the, the dry biting, like bitter wind that blows across deserts. Oh, oh yes. Oh, you're so yes. right. The possibilities are basically as endless as the wind itself yes yeah that's really cool that it could be anything from from the the sandstorm to the monsoon i love that i love that line all right so then um next step the class this might be my favorite role of the entire show yes Uh, i think there is an incredible amount of tension and weight for every one of us before the the dice for the class Mm mm-hmm the only one I think maybe I like uh, equally would be the personality traits because I think that immediately opens up for really cool things for the characters. I agree. All right, we got a D12 to determine that class. 10, Ranger. Ooh. 
an air ganasi ranger what what better what better ways to put the wind into your fletching than to be the wind itself oh excellent way to put it brother that's so cool that's so cool you know i i immediately picture the um fantasy equivalent of of like the movie wanted <laughs> she's like bending arrows and stuff oh my gosh dude just oh you missed no look behind you the arrow's like hits like hits like a strong gust just hits it and just flips it oh, that is awesome so then let's let's take a look at what uh genasi let's take a look at what genasi get good call yeah take a take a look at that wiki Tell me what you got. I'll go. Uh, I can write us down. Ability score increase. Your Constitution score increases by two, and Dexterity score increases by one. Let's see. They mature at the same rate as humans, reach adulthood in their late teens, and they live somewhat longer than humans, up to 120 years. Their alignment, generally, is independent, self-reliant. Ganassi tend toward a neutral alignment. Medium size, base speed is 30. And they have unending breath. You can hold your breath indefinitely while you are not incapacitated. You've also got Mingle with the Wind. You can cast the Levitate spell once with this trait, requiring no material components, and you regain the ability to cast it this way when you finish a long rest. Constitution is your spell casting ability for this spell. So then she's tough. Mm hmm. This is a strong gale. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's interesting that it's uh, like I don't as far as I know I can't think of any other combination that uses constitution as a spell casting modifier it is far and few between isn't it yeah that's interesting um, so yeah but speaking of uh, uh, alignment let's see what type of gal this is if she fits in with how, how it normally rolls or if she's got something up her sleeve we got a three three is lawful evil oh all right all right there's a lot to work with there a lawful evil air genasi ranger wow then let me ask you guys let me ask you guys the uh the lawful evil do you think that is a do you think that is a personality flaw of of the character her well maybe not maybe not even a flaw do you think that is a personality trait of the character herself or do you think that is the society at large that she is situated into that's a good question that's a really good question and that kind of kind of informs where she sits in, in her society you know depending on how much she she embraces that so i, I I've got something. So what if kind of going with this lawful evil society, what if and I'm going back to like this ice, this ice type, I keep seeing this cold. They're in this just snowed village. This village has snow, you know, 90% of the year. It's like almost like a, a, a refuge for like bandit, bandit activity. But like there is like, there's like a bandit law that goes on here. If you know what I mean? Like, you guys, this is your haven away from normal society. This is where we have to live in order to have, I guess, a somewhat normal life as outlaws. This is like the Tortuga of the North. Yes. The Pirate's Cove of, uh, of the Tundra. I see. That is something that I hadn't even considered. They come from a society in which... In which banditry and piracy are celebrated or maybe she maybe she found herself here uh being maybe maybe um as an air genasi they're they're descended from jinns from genies her lawful nature uh, is is almost um innate it's bound to her by the laws that her lineage had to follow to even enter the, the material realm bro i'm uh, screaming over yes. here that's so cool yes and and her her evil, uh, her evil really might be that she grew up in this in this frozen, barren uh, pirate cove. Yes. Making making deals with these people, and you know she's bound by that the that that genie sort of thing inside of her to to like I you know you do for me I do for you but then she's also perhaps and that's you know her following by the rules of how how she how she she functions but then um 
you know perhaps it's still at the end of the day it's all about numero uno it's all about how can i manipulate this situation to my benefit yes yes i i like that a lot it's it's still um about how how can i monkey paw this wish how can i fulfill uh, my contract uh without giving them um i guess what they want how can i keep from this contract more than what my bargain says and still get paid that yeah yeah exactly that's very cool and i think that kind of tells us we need to make sure to pump some points into wisdom she needs to have some street smarts yes i agree this this is already uh the makings of a character who who's gritty they've they maybe they have been on the streets maybe aurora has maybe aurora's been alone for a long time Maybe her parents, maybe she was born into this, like born in this little outlaw bandit, of, you know, northern camp. Her parents kind of were ragtag members of this crew and, you know, she was born and then just left there, like just left at like the tavern and the, the tavern keep decided to raise her, like, you know, as his daughter. But he does it he does it for the express purpose of like i will raise you as my daughter because someday someone will come looking for you and then i will say look how i well i raised your daughter pay me for all my time spent yes because i mean this is this is the bandit bandit outposts and they don't even have like a father-daughter relationship it is purely like a transactional relationship like i i'm here and i'm raising you to make sure that you make me money one day you're an investment. I keep you alive. That's it. What a dog. What an absolute dog. Yes. This also brings up another thing that I realize we've been forgetting is, is um, like character background. So, you know, this one totally fits into criminal and getting the, like, the benefits that come along with that. I mean, perhaps we'll need to do some additions to some of our previous episodes to make sure that we take that into account oh you're right you're right we might want to hit up um backgrounds because we i guess we did we didn't didn't we we completely forgot about that for Baracus. certainly um so then let's let's do a little bit more rolling we've got some personality traits that we need to figure out for this character let's figure out how how aurora's personality works we've got a 16 chronic liar oh and an 18 organized perfect criminal right here i i don't think that i don't think we even have a choice yeah <laughs> i don't think there's there's a i don't think there's a better fitting background for a a compulsive liar a, a, an organized compulsive evil liar dude that's a dangerous quality there like a dangerous combination of qualities you know being able to say i'm a chronic liar i can't help it i'm always telling little fibs but i'm organized enough that i can keep track of them her charisma is gonna have to be like off the charts oh yeah i i agree with you she's gonna be the type of person who can like talk her way around people but then also you, you know uh keep keep tabs of it so that she doesn't end up walking herself or talking herself into a corner yeah she's got to be able to be um quick-witted especially growing up with like that purely transactional like like childhood into adulthood type deal where it's like yeah she had to learn how to lie to get what she needed to get by other than just the f bare minimum food that she was given so then that that kind of that's interesting because she's totally then uh, a product of her environment mm -hmm. it's it's absolutely a and that could be sort of like the call for her um her personal story that brings her along with the group or brings her out is is maybe she's having a struggle of 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 like a crisis of character where she's thinking am i am i a product of, of my environment or is this truly who i am oh i know a shift in alignment is her like is her end goal is to like learn how to become like a good person this this is an evil character that is aware and does not want to be. Mm-hmm. Oh man. But through but through the the pull of her her own lineage and the the environment the. Uh... I'm I'm struggling. I'm still coming up with that like nature versus nurture. Like is that is that the 
you know the innate or am i just picking up what i've picked up over over time i know what you mean there is a there is a good word for it this is a character that was almost born evil. She she maybe doesn't have much of a choice until she gets the self-awareness to to kind of see it in herself through the the pull of her own lineage. The the evil that sits with most genies and gen run in her body and so she has that automatic compulsion to want to manipulate, to distrust of uh of the more mortal races and then being locked into a cold and frozen bitter world world that is constantly at her throat with a at very best caretaker not a parent at all mm -hmm. this is this is a character that ha almost had no choice but to be born and bred and created evil but she maybe doesn't want to be yep. oh my goodness perhaps yeah. that is a like evidence of her her like true parentage like yes her dad was a genie who who was evil and went by this loss but she had a mother who was truly good and truly benevolent and and some of that passed down so she's got this like little tug in the middle of her chest that says like like where every time she does it she's she's like she's disappointed in herself but she doesn't really understand why oh just a self conflict but then she's also had a lot of success and she sees what this you know how this re how these how her actions reward her so then she's conflicted too because you know maybe the one time in her life that she actually did try to do something benevolent or good she got ridiculed for it and so it was like well like i can't win especially being in like in the society she's in like why did you do that for that person like what we don't do that here precisely maybe maybe her attempts at being good while growing up were just dashed they were they were ripped to pieces pushed back into her face if anything if anything she is a prime example that no good deed goes unpunished yes sir that's where that organization can come into so she's constantly how am i going to organize my thoughts and my steps of how i'm going to approach the situation so i do not get ridiculed for my decisions this is all self-preservation. Her her evil is is to protect her own self. I like that too, because then it's I don't know, because it sort of kind of bends the word, you know, is that evil or is that just selfishness? I guess that's traditionally kind of associated as a as a negative quality, but you know, I wouldn't necessarily associate just say like that person's selfish. Well, they're evil, um, so it could kind of be the soupy. Uh, I'm I'm getting the vibe that uh, from where maybe from where she comes from maybe in her hometown she is considered neutral, uh, but in the world at large where she comes from is just such a a bitter and and resentful place that her interactions with halflings and gnomes and humans she is mean she is evil but it's it's self preservation and if they were from where she was from it wouldn't be as heavily uh stigmatized yeah it's like it's like if they would just from be where i was common. from <laughs> yeah yeah no i like that i like that and it was just like you know they say the party then has the chance to go to the place where she is from and they're like dang everybody here sucks <laughs> y'all are a bunch of freaking buttheads out here i also think that that just kind of going back to the the environment like Peyton, that's a fantastic idea because it's such a unique twist on something that we like all we already know you know the um whenever you think of piracy or at least whenever i think of piracy i immediately think of blue waters blue skies you know sunshine islands coconuts palm trees and i love the idea of saying like nah what if it's it's piracy but but you know these ships have have big metal front ends on them so that they can like crack the ice as they're pushing their way through yes. and and these pirates wear layers and layers of furs and these thick you know um this thick clothing that keeps them warm in this environment and and it's it's you know that's that's such a cool take on that mm -hmm. yeah, i mean like 
Yeah, you have like you say you've got you you've got your your ports, your sea ports and stuff that are all trying to push through this area. And I mean, this is just like a, a an outpost just cropped on like a middle of an iceberg type deal. But like it's still connected due to the ice to the mainland. So like they do have like uh, the almost like dog sled teams that pull in for like trade routes and stuff. And like they're constantly getting robbed and held up by these guy uh, these these pirate esque type bandits that are like riding beside them on these like bestial animals just be like hey whoa 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 hey you're coming through here you gotta pay a toll and then you know stuff like that oh, what what a what a wild and fun idea to explore the the concept that that pirates and raiders maybe some of their ships are ships and they dredge through the thick ice breaking it as mm -hmm. they go but maybe just as often as you find pirates with a ship you find pirates with a giant sled pulled by by these big heavy ice beast raiders are on sleds pulled by dogs mm -hmm. you're oh, so yeah. right so yeah. fast and nimble yeah that's red that's so red it's just like like a like a real gnarly version of balto you know like yeah the yeah dogs have these like they're 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 hellhounds they've got spines and, and horns and, and and even they'd have to be you know some kind of of creature that could that could survive in this natural environment and then like this almost seems like it would be a place where like if you didn't know about it, it you like you never would go there because it's like not only is this the most hostile environment possible but like you step foot here and more than likely someone's gonna kill you and take your stuff yeah you will be robbed there's like there's like no i am you might get robbed no you you go through here and you don't have a guide or protection or you haven't paid someone for protection yeah you're gonna be robbed you know, Peyton, I think you might have also just stumbled on to exactly what Ooh. Aurora does. You are so Yo. right. You are so right. I think you just spoke into existence what Aurora does. Is that she is a she's a ranger. She's a guide. She's protection. Out here in this this hostile environment, in this uh in this ice world that would just as soon kill you as as leave you, you know, frozen on a bank, she guides merchants she takes people from from place to place yeah right i love that and she doesn't do it benevolently it's not because i want to make sure these people get to the right place it's because well we're gonna get to the right place and they're gonna fill my pockets full of gold and if they don't i take their stuff right you know say that she she she's in the middle of a job and she like overhears somebody talking about how they're gonna like they're going to um, like cut her out of the deal by the time they get to where they're going or they're gonna you know betray her in some way so then she just like purposefully leads them into like oh. the wasteland like leads them into the like the mouth of a cave where there's a terrible creature just like hungry and waiting oof be like yeah just uh just down this pass here we've we've got uh you know quick shortcut trust me we'll be we be you know takes three hours three or four hours off our drive or off our off our uh our hike here. Off our ride. Yeah. Oh, okay. Some giant, like, gnarly, like, leopard seal-esque that's, like, ten times the normal size <laughs> den. Yeah, how cool. Uh, here's, here's another idea, then. What, what if that's what got her in trouble? Ooh. What if her, what if her compulsive lying, uh, got her in trouble? What if she has a bad habit of telling the the people that she that she is escorting um that it is safe when maybe it's not what if she has a bad habit of overselling herself and her own confidence is that yeah of course i've made that run before i can do that run i know the safe journeys when in all honesty she has no idea it's all bluster it's all just hoping that when she gets out there she can figure it out the ice is always shifting I see what you mean, and and like her not necessarily being confident in her abilities, but she's just confident in her way to at, at least you know talk her way out of it, or 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 perhaps lead someone to to their death, and then she won't have to explain herself. I mean, if they die, she gets to keep their she gets to keep their goods. That's true. That's just you know that's just adding money. But then maybe that's a conflict of character too, where you know she has. She has the the gin genie transactional 
like foundation and so like she knows that she's doing wrong you know that goes against her lawful evil sort of nature is because it's like there's supposed to be a transaction here there's supposed to be a give and a take and i'm just taking then oh i was i was i was thinking then maybe maybe she uh she does oversell herself with her compulsive lying um but uh maybe she also feels bound to those lies after she has said them she feels like the need to finish the transaction she has to kind of rise above the the lies that she she made that's an interesting take on it where where then she's a compulsive liar yes but then once the lie is told it becomes her truth and then she's she's like she's extremely dedicated to 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 fulfilling you know fulfilling that lie yeah, she uh, she has the she has the reputation. She is she's almost known for being um, untrustworthy, and uh, she she wants to get she wants to get away from that. She wants to leave that. Yes. Uh, and so the lies that she makes, um, the promises that she knows she can't fulfill, she still feels oath bound. She has to fill fo- like, she has to fold them like fill them out. Yes. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. And, and I think that's also a really cool way to take an evil character who does, you know, evil things, but, but there's, there's, there's backstory, there's reasoning, there's, there's purpose behind this. And so that would make it to where this isn't a hollow character that's just doing these evil things for the sake of doing it. There's some kind of conflict going on inside of them that's, that's pushing them either way. That's, that's, that, that, that I love the idea of like getting it you know, some actual meaning or purpose behind their actions. Yes. And even if they ever truly, like, become a good person, they're still going to have the aspects of just being a complete, just, like, grizzled, hard person. You know what I mean? Almost like a a barkeep bouncer, you know? Like, yeah, I know how to do good. I, I consider myself good. But you know what? I can go back to it in a heartbeat if I have to. So don't tempt me. I see. I see. Well, boys, I think that's been a nice little chat about Aurora. Um, You know what time it is. I think it's time to roll some stats. Let's get the stats. All right, so we're going to grab four D6s here. We're going to roll them collectively six times. Drop the lowest. Let's see what our numbers are. Um, Somebody got a pen ready? You ready to, to keep these down for me? This is a team effort. One team, one dream. All right, ready when you are, sir. First roll. Six, three, two, eleven. Six, six, five. That's seventeen. Six, two, three, eleven. Six, five, two. Six, five, two. That's thirteen. We've got six, six, four, sixteen. How many are we at, Peyton? We got one, two, three, four, five. One more. One more. Let's see what we got. One last one. Six, five, three, fourteen. My goodness, boys! This right. this is a powerhouse. Let's uh let's hear those numbers. Will you call those out, Peyton? Yes, sir. So we've got eleven, seventeen, eleven, thirteen, sixteen, and fourteen. Wow. No sub tens. Modifiers for days. No negative numbers on this character sheet. Yeah, this is going to be a strong character for sure. So we're going to have um, from the from the the Ganassi background, we're getting a plus two in constitution and plus one in dexterity. So we've got that benefit already there. Let's see. We talked about we wanted her to be to be able to talk pretty well. So charisma, I feel like, needs to be one of those higher scores. I agree. Dexterity. I, I certainly I certainly agree. I think uh, I think even for a for a ranger who's can usually dump charisma. I think for this particular character, charisma might be kind of her her strong suit, her her bright and shining moments. Yes, and especially with with being able to like work with these modifiers, um, you know, we could like put the seventeen in charisma and then put the fourteen in, in dex, and she still gets the plus two, so they still gets the the sixteen. Yeah. So that she's still being able to to pump out good damage with her arranged weapon as well. I I think that I th- I think we should. I I think you talked us right into it. Yep, I agree. So that puts charisma at seventeen, 
that puts dexterity at 16. We'll cut that off. So then that leaves us 11, 11, 13, 14. It, this might be this might be maybe our own natural biases because I noticed that we we have an eye we have a penchant for perception. But I don't want to let wisdom go, especially not for a a ranger character whose whose casting is going to be focused around it. I I say we put the the fourteen in in wisdom. I'm with you there. That's yep. that's solid um, solid thought process. I'm absolutely in agreement. Yep, that's fair. So that leaves us thirteen eleven eleven. Um, since we get the plus two, why don't we put that in the constitution? 11 strength, 11 intelligence. Yeah. Um, so then let's stick that 13 in constitution. Since she has the plus two from her uh, her racial background, that'll make her up to a, a solid 15. Shoo. I like, I like these odd numbers. It leaves so much room to grow with the ability stat increases. I see what you mean. So that way, with the ability stat increase, so you get those at 4, 8... 12 16 is that correct yes every fourth and so you can either take a plus two in one ability or a plus one in one ability and with with being able to like split it up against the plus one you know you put one in, in constitution one in charisma and bump both of those up to the next modifier okay so then speaking of modifiers we're gonna have 11 for strength zero constitution is gonna be 15 it's gonna give us a nice plus two dex 16 plus 1, so that's 17, which gives us a plus 3 modifier. Wisdom is 14, that's going to give us a plus 2 modifier. 11 intelligence, that's going to give us a plus 0. And then finally, charisma, 17, plus 3. Jeez, man. Strong character here. Yeah, especially when you take that into account at the beginning of first level, they're going to have plus 2 proficiency, so anything that they get to add proficiency to you know, that's, that's plus four, plus five, plus five to, to rolls already off the bat. That's a really, really strong starting for a character. I think what I'm, uh, I think what I'm honestly most impressed with is a, is a ranger with good charisma. Yeah, like you said, that's traditionally a dump stat for a charisma. And I'm all about working a character out of their normal comfort zone or their normal, like, place where they sit. I, I think that we I think we like to uh, to maybe try and, and look at using a character in a little bit of a different way than than you would see at the uh, stereotypical table. I agree. I don't think I've ever come up with a character that fits any type of normal play style. Certainly, that comes to my detriment though, because one thing that I I would love to take advantage of in my play is like D and D Beyond. I I think that's such a good resource to have everything there, but it is so like tempting to play some type of homebrew character then that doesn't work within that framework of D&D Beyond but I, I would love to be able to just like play a character that would like just just works right out of the the, ba the gate you know um so then we also need to add um health and AC AC is going to be 10 plus the dex modifier that's going to give us an AC of 13 health is going to be 10 plus the constitution modifier 12 health 13 AC. We're going to go with the criminal background, which would give her, I believe, some proficiencies, and then also um, a, a with with criminal background, you get the ability to have like a criminal communication ring that you can like always deliver a message and always receive a message from one particular person. Um, I can see that really working out and kind of being in sync with, uh, you know, perhaps she works for a, a company or a group that, that facilitate that travel across the, um, the, the vast icy snowy wastes. Um, and so then she's always kind of got a person that she can communicate with. Ooh, and it would be really neat if, you know, that means of, of, of manifesting that communication is through like, she's got a, uh, you know, some like gnarly snow pigeon that she like can attach a message to his foot and he knows exactly where to fly to go deliver it to the big orc that, that you know, that she answers to. And then he gives the pigeon a message and flies them all back and he knows exactly where to go within the tundra to 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 send those messages back and forth. Trevor, you, you were playing, I wasn't going to say this earlier because I didn't know how viable this would have been, but like you... Say she's on a route with a with a merchant that she has been hired by, and they are 
this is a pretty pretty loaded merchant that she's that she's with she sends this message she's working with that orc uh, and i was thinking his name was like grius or something like that and she sends this message to be like hey this guy's loaded whatever he's paying us is nothing with what the cargo he's carrying so they she sends this message off and they come and raid this this merchant and he can either one surrender all of his goods or two he can pay them off so either way it's a win-win i see that's interesting that's really cool and and then them having no idea that like she was she called them there yeah like oh yeah yeah i'll protect you through this this guy's got some fat stacks I, I really, I really like that. I really like maybe, uh, maybe running with this this Grius character. Um, maybe this is a con that that Aurora has uh, has run a couple of times. Maybe this is the con that that put her on her adventure path, that got her in the trouble, that got her out of the town that that she had called home. Yeah, her work with her work with Grius. Um, got her into uh, into some hot water in her own hometown, and now she needs to find new marks i see everybody knows that she's full of it like they know that she's she's gonna lie and so she has to go somewhere else to find other people to dupe yep yeah that's cool that's cool and 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 once again good motivation to to get your your character out of their home and out of their comfort zone and, and on an adventure uh, personally, I think I think that is something that uh, when when any anybody is making a character, whenever you are are creating something for a very early campaign, or even you know like a maybe a mid level or like a late level campaign, uh, you need to put something into your backstory that gives you that that freedom of movement, something that that pushes you to to be away from where your setting has built you up around. I totally agree. I totally agree. Because then you have, it's not going to be any kind of um, difficulty for your DM to pull you into the story. You've, you've got built-in motivation. And, and the one thing that, you know, really any, any, any player uh, wants is to have a character that the DM can easily, can easily work with. Because that's how you get the hooks. That's how you get the plot. That's how you really get the story that, you know, that, that people care about that brings them back to the table that puts their their butts into chairs is is the world around them meaning something to their character and their character meaning something to the world around themselves you yes, asked dude preach that's really good i think that's also why i don't think i've ever come up with just a like a normal a normal-esque type character if you know what i mean like doesn't fit just straight into like oh this is just a fighter you know what i mean oh, no this is a fighter with some flavor that was just an example yeah, I know that, and that's, that's, I mean, it goes back to, to last episode when we were talking about Brachus, and we are talking about, you know, it couldn't just be a paladin. It immediately came into, like, oh, well, this guy works for the bank. This guy's an auditor. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, I don't know, maybe let's, uh, where, where do you think that, uh, Aurora would fall into a party then? Like, what, what do you, what do you think Aurora's role in, in a, in a, in an adventuring D&D party? If someone wanted to use this character... What kind of party would she want to be around? What what kind of party would would best be able to really use Aurora? At, at least for sure, I could see the the uh, you know her her position and her profession being a really good way to to bring her in. You know, say the party is one of the groups that has hired her to get them across the 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 snowy wastes and so then that's her initiation is like oh well you know we we are you are a guide and we're hired to you and then maybe something called you know catastrophically goes wrong that then um brings the party all together where they've got to they've got to do something um you know maybe they've got to um you know some oh what if it's the back the the opposite end you know usually she's the one who's causing the you know she's du duping these people they keep getting robbed um but say then they they get the party gets robbed um and everyone's looking at her and she's like look for once this has nothing to do with me and then the party has to go back to grius and they've got to like figure out how where did this where does this corruption lie is it with grius or have you betrayed me or is it someone up and uh higher above i i think it would have to be fitting in some kind of like you know revenge story sort of setting be like grius would be like hey look it's just business i know we work together but hey i gotta make i gotta make my money yeah i like that 
just kind of almost like a double cross. Yeah, but then, you know, say the the first kind of little arc is is they go to Grius and there's that conflict around Grius and then say once that once that conflict is solved, then then where does Aurora sit? You know, what's the what's the greater story to be told with this? Maybe uh, maybe Grius saved her from the town. Like she got run out of town and saved her. And then like, you know, and then he eventually does double cross her. And now she's like, she is done with him. And is like, look, I don't want anything to do with this area anymore. Let's get out of here. Like, she's just so done with everything that's gone on in this area. I see. And so it's really just like Michael said, she's dealing with the repercussions of her actions of building this reputation for herself. And now she, she, she has to go somewhere else to be able to, to support, you know, even making a living. Yep. I, I think that uh, in whatever party um, Aurora finds herself in, I, I think that she's going to be the Vegeta. <laughs> That's good. I think, I think, that, I think that she is a, a true-to-nature heel. Um, the Raphael, if you will, the always antagonistic, um, but somehow still always there for the party character. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, and I really like the the um, what is the what is the connection you made there, uh, Raphael? Because what do they say in the intro song? Raphael is cool but rude. She's got high charisma, you know. She's she's <laughs> she's likable, but she's just rough around the edges. Maybe just a little bit frosty. Hey. <laughs> And once again, that makes just for like, that's an interesting character. You know, how do you do someone who is abrasive, but still charismatic? Who needs a bar? You know, that kind of makes me think of a, a, um, you know, is that like a Homelander style character? Who, huh. you know, is she just, is she nuts? <laughs> I, on a, that's probably about as, that is, that is a, you know what, that is, if that wasn't the idea that was in my head, it is now. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Um, so then let's take a look at how that would look as a character. Um, so we've got we've got all of our stats here. We've got everything that comes from an Ergonasi and from her from criminal. What comes along with um, a first level ranger? The level one ranger, uh, their proficiency bonus, a plus two, pretty pretty flat across most uh, most classes. Um, they get the uh, the favored enemy features. They get the natural explorer feature. Um, they have the deft explorer optional feature, uh, and then the favored foe optional feature. I see. So let's um, give us give us a little rundown on on favored enemy and natural explorer, please. Then, uh, as a just kind of a, an overall breakdown of what a, a favored enemy is, is that at level one, um, you pick a type of enemy that you have significant experience in you know studying tracking hunting down um something like beast or celestials dragons fey fiends you you pick a subtype for a monster after you pick that subtype uh you get advantage on wisdom checks for survival um when you are trying to uh track uh said favorite enemy you can also learn one language of your choice that is spoken by your favorite enemies so that you can i guess better converse with those you hate uh, nice. you, you choose one additional favorite enemy uh, and an associated language at 6 and 14. And then I also see here, alternatively, you can select two races of humanoids, such as gnolls and orcs, as favorite enemies as well. Maybe, uh, maybe up here in the, in the ice, um, with Grisha, or Grisha as, a, as an NPC, maybe there are a lot of orcs up here. Maybe she is well adept at... Uh, at the inner working of, of an orcish colony maybe uh, maybe that's what you know yeah the the main uh race up here is orcs and gnolls maybe that's you know they that's how they get around and then natural explorer uh at first level um you are particularly familiar with a type of environment you know given maybe the arctic the coast desert mountains the underdark um then when you make an intelligence check or a wisdom check related to your favorite terrain your proficiency bonus is double. Oh, wow. That could be huge. And I mean, it, it says, yeah. like, your favorite terrain, Arctic, it kind of calls that yeah, at the very beginning. That's that's yeah. definitely what I think we would use for Aurora. 
And it's funny, I don't know if it was just a subconscious thing, because we're talking about this environment, and it, you know, I just said, you know, she, she reports to this orc. And I think it was a subconscious thing of like relating it to the home game that Michael and I play in. His character is an orc from a frosty northern place called Govi Altai. So this is, I mean, Aurora is basically, she's working herself into the, the world that we've created to play our game in. That is she she fits wild. absolutely perfectly. Maybe y'all can use this character as a as a random NPC that shows up. Yeah, this is one that like I I would actually be inclined to to send to our DM and say, you know, hey, see if you could work this person in, or or you know, here's just a, an NPC for you if you need something. Mm -hmm. And I think giving her the favored terrain of arctic from natural explorer fits really well that gives her a lot of you know she gets to to excel in that environment which she absolutely should it is not only the environment that she's grown up in but it is it is an environment that is innate to her nature you know like i could see maybe you know t to the point where she can um she can almost like hear sense things across the wind across the 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 arctic you know she she can like gather information or gather you know um, signs of you know good or, or bad omens coming their way just by like the shifting of the ice and how the wind blows over the ice sheets and kind of like rushes past her in like different patterns I I really I, I really like that idea. She she maybe has a, a better idea on how to to tell the weather in a world that is gray on top and then white under your feet. Yes. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. That's interesting. And then also where does that where does that sort of ability originate? Is this something that comes from her 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 genie background where it is this natural thing where she can just you know, she is in tune with the winds of nature and the howling, and, and, it, and it speaks to her. Or is it divine in nature, where there is some kind of frosty god that is, that is communicating to her? Maybe it's some type of deity trying to guide her from her evil ways and out of the Arctic, out of the frozen wastes. Or potentially an evil deity that's trying to help her conquer this place yes and she's trying to either resist or fall straight into it that's cool because then maybe it's it's whispering you know the wind blows and it tells her like you know th these people aren't worth your time or like you know like she's 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 being pushed either way you know they're lying to you they have more than what what they say oh yeah that's cool i think we've uh we've pretty much nailed what we can for now on this character what do you guys think i am i am inclined to agree she really aurora kind of came together i feel like we we got like you know ganasi and then as soon as we associate i guess whenever we even hit air ganasi which is like the second role we did like peyton you kind of hit that that stride and like the character was almost created instantaneously and yeah. all of the rest of this is just sort of yes ending that flows off of that like one really solid base idea so like really great job there man appreciate that thank you and isn't that the the very soul of of creating a uh a, a like a flavorful and fun character is to yes and it into into something that you you want to explore further absolutely absolutely and to turn that into um you know uh, the, the the whole character creation process becomes this really organic thing that then turns you know a uh a picture of a, a character into a real person or someone who is has the qualities of a real person mm -hmm. and that just makes for a cooler more interesting character to play if that's the case um then i say uh and once again i'm gonna put the ball in your guys's court have you got anything else that's that's on your on the front of your 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 perennial lobes that needs to explode out of your brains I think we've just about, I think we've just about covered it top to bottom. In that case, Peyton, my man, we need some, uh, we need some random fictional characters. All right, let me get, get it pulled up here. Let's see what we get this time around. Last time we had five. This is, um, 
This is just a fun bit we like to do. We want to pull a random fictional character from whatever type of um, property that's out there, and we just want to relate them to the 5th edition D&D perspective. What type of class would this character be? Um, in the past, we've done um, uh, Master Yoda and uh, the Cat in the Hat. This has been a really kind of fun exercise to kind of broaden our perspectives as like what we even think, what we think, who these characters are, and then how we could maybe work characters and, and work fun things like this into your own um, individual characters. All right. I have got some interesting ones that we can do this. Week I this. like that enthusiasm. I can hear it in his voice. So we have Daffy Duck. We've got Hercules from the the old cartoon Hercules movie. We have Nala from The Lion King. We've got Friar Tuck from Robin Hood, the the, the Fox movie Robin Hood. And then we've got Smaug the dragon. What a what an odd lineup. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. a that's a real um, strange cast of characters there. Not your usual suspects. No. Um um <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know we did like kookiness kind of last uh, last episode here, but I'm partial to Daffy Duck. But if anyone else has anything else or any ideas that came to mind with any of the other characters, nope, 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 nope. You talk, <laughs> you you hit the nail right on the head. The the cat in the hat was so much fun. Um, I say we take a run at Daffy Duck. I am I am a hundred percent in agreement. I think it's time to go um, to go a hundred percent Daffy. All right, let's roll. I got my D sixes. I'm ready to roll my stats. This is gonna get loony. <laughs> We've got uh, three, three, two for an eight. <laughs> We've got three, three, four for a ten. Six five and three that's 14 six five two 13 four three three for ten how many were we got we got one more one more one more gotcha oh boy uh five six seven eight nine daffy's looking a little wobbly here so then just just for a for a recap then we have eight ten fourteen thirteen 10 again and 9. That is correct, yes. Personally, I, I absolutely love the direction the dice uh, decided to take us in on this one because what do we know about Daffy Duck? He is he is always the second runner to Bugs. 100%. Oh my gosh, you're so right. It makes total sense for him to like not be as good. Even though I got to admit, whenever I was a kid, I think I always preferred Daffy. Well, I think those are fighting words saved for a different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll, I'll see you on the other one. I'll see you on the other one with Dukes up, brother. We don't talk about Fight Club. Um, oh, boy. Uh, let's see. What do we think should be his highest? What do you think should get the 14? Part of oh. me, part of me says charisma again because I think... See, that's my other half. Part of me says charisma because Daffy always seemed to be like the kind of... The, the chatty kind of guy. Though, I do agree with you. I think that if anyone would have the highest charisma, it would be Bugs Bunny. So, I do like the idea of putting 14 in Constitution because that is the other thing we all know about Daffy Duck is that dude is durable. Yes, getting his beak blown backwards constantly. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite bit is the one from the the robin hood episode where he like he he gets up in the tree and he's gonna swing down and steal the dude's coins off him and he hits every consecutive tree on the way down <laughs> yes Too dude oh. yikes head away <laughs> <laughs> He goes down and he, he like he takes his saw and he saws down every single tree so that he can look through and he still smacks the rock. Like that's classic. Um They don't make cartoons like that anymore. Not at all. Not at all. So so then do we wanna do we wanna work our way down as to like you know, do we wanna put the thirteen into where he would be next good or do we wanna flip the opposite and see where he deserves to have his lowest? I, I almost I almost wanna start with his class. I see. Yeah. And then maybe fill the blanks, fill the blanks in, uh, fill, fill the blanks in from there. What are what are your what are your thoughts there? Daffy Duck is an illusions wizard. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, that's Daffy Duck. 
has infinite pockets to pull out every strange bobbin and doodad and bit and piece that he needs for whatever wacky scheme that he's got, but then they never show up again. They disappear the very instant that he looks away from them. That's acting I, for you. Dude, yeah, you're blowing my mind. Like, that's not... I didn't even have... You know, I didn't even have a direction to even point in. I was really going to rely on you guys, and I think you knocked it out of the park. Yeah, I think I think Daffy Duck has, uh, has a bag of holding and some very, very uh, tricky <laughs> fingers, and he just pulls out whatever he needs um, and he makes it there on the spot. So then should we give him a, like a decent dexterity score so he can have like kind of good sleight of hand for whipping these things out? I'd be in favor for it because he's chatty, but Daffy's an asshole. I don't know how, <laughs> how much charisma he really has. <laughs> I'm, ske I'm skeptical. So then we'll put the 13 in dexterity. We'll give him the blanket 10 in, in charisma. Because I think that he's, I don't know, I think that, that the lowest score should go into either, like, wisdom or intelligence. Because, like, he's always getting goofed on. I agree. Yeah, he is He is always up to a to a scheme uh, that's not going to work. I say lowest would be his intelligence, just because he is constantly being outsmarted by anyone and everyone. How about we do, how about a, um, how about we do 10 in strength? nine in wisdom eight in intelligence i think honestly i think that's about that's about as good as daffy could hope for <laughs> as he could hope for <laughs> i think the uh, i think the blanket 10 in strength is is a right in line with daffy never have i seen him do anything wildly strong he's not in incredibly intelligent what this what this, what this bird has going for him is his ability to get beat up uh and his ability to ignore it yes 100 <laughs> percent he's so backwards too because if he's a wizard his spell casting is going to go off his intelligence <laughs> <laughs> and i mean it fits though oh it's true it's true <laughs> it just backfires constantly but i mean that totally makes sense you know we've got a guy who's not apt at doing this you know he, he i agree his his plans his plots his schemes they're harebrained and no one, no one with with a high intelligence is harebrained. And maybe, perhaps we can work that into like mechanically into the character somehow. Like, what if he has he's got an, a a a he's got a unique um, feature that is literally just called harebrained, and it's you know, whenever you um, attempt something. Like, maybe whenever you attempt something that you would have disadvantage on, you get an additional plus to your roll or something. Like, what if, uh, what if, what if, what if, um, it, at any, at any given moment, um, Daffy could choose, uh, to, to cast something harebrained, uh, and he switches his intelligence for his con, or his casting modifier on those spells, but they, uh, they come... They come with uh, maybe some kind of some kind of detriment, some kind of uh, negative. Maybe it hurts him. Maybe they get advantage on their save for it. That's brilliant. Yeah, really, really good good idea. I really love that. Like switching it to where he will have the benefit, but it still comes at a cost. Like I, I, I like what you said about you know the he he you know he has a better chance to cast a spell. It's going on a different modifier, but like it can affect him too. You gotta make sure he doesn't blow himself up exactly oh my goodness what if what if he can harebrain his spell and he uses constitution to cast it but if they save it backfires yes. oh my gosh yes. and he takes and he takes half damage yes yes i think that's a great little like detriment that's a great little drawback and something that would be so much fun as far as like you're playing that character and you know I feel like for the whole party too. Like, is he gonna harebrain this? And if he is, like, is it gonna? <laughs> how's it gonna go? Is it gonna benefit them, or is it gonna like? Is it gonna benefit us? I will say, maybe, maybe not half damage. Maybe like one d four, but like something along the lines. That that's better. Maybe we'll bring it in line a little bit more, but it has to blow up in his face. Has to. Has to. That's that's really interesting. If it blows up in his face, maybe on his next attack roll, he can't do harebrained, and it has to, and it has disadvantage because he's recovering from the like the explosion, the mishap. I like that. I would also be willing to give it a, um, you know, you you can do this an X amount of times, and it recharges on a short rest. 
you know, at level one, maybe he's got, he can, he can do like one hair brain scheme or, or maybe two. That way he's limited to like one or two opportunities, you know, between, between combats um, and can still have a little bit of flexibility there. Maybe when he gets to be like higher levels, his harebrained schemes could be grander and he, he expends more of these harebrained charges to have either a great payoff or a great, like a greater detriment to himself. I really like that too. The, uh, the, the kind of the, the stacking, um, or maybe like the, the growing harebrained schemes. All right, boys. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think we've, I think we've chatted. I think we put Daffy Duck down on paper. Definitely. That would be a, you know, if we, if, if there was a game that, you know, had, had him and our creation of the cat in the hat, you know, like we're already building up to this, like very loony, toony, wacky, like potential, like one shot with these guys that would be just complete chaos. What I would like to see with these characters, it would be maybe for somehow, like, your one-shot party has to fight these characters in like just a coliseum-esque type fight and just wacky wild insane things are going on at all times you know i think uh i think that is uh prime material for for a later episode maybe some kind of uh created character tournament I think that's a cool idea. It would also be kind of fun, like you said, to do a a like a battle battle royale with like maybe not a battle royale, but sort of like a, um, a coliseum match between the like seriously generated characters and then then these wackos. Oh my gosh! Yeah, the discrepancy between like both sides of the battlefield would just be completely insane. And with that, I think we've exhausted our brains. Um, for this episode, uh, we've got a really, really interesting idea for a uh, Ergonasi, um like dog sled pirate, um, as well as a kind of guess at what kind of silly illusion wizard Daffy Duck would be. Um, so thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out. It's been a blast. I'm Trevor. I'm Michael. And I'm Peyton. And this has been Roll Your Stats.